My name is uh, Matt Ranastay. I, I work for uh, Intel. And uh, thanks, thanks for coming to my talk, SIGROC using logic to debug logic. Uh, how many people here have actually heard of SIGROC before? Okay, how many people have used it? Okay, so there's a few people. Uh, so basically, it's SIGROC is uh, a project to uh, enable, uh, instead of using proprietary software for your oscilloscopes and logic analyzers, uh, basically have a common framework that uh, you can use uh, so you don't have to rely on proprietary software on, uh, and their formats on data. Uh, some of the devices we support is like logic analyzers, oscilloscopes, uh, other analog devices. Uh, it has a common framework. Um, device metadata and the interfacing to the devices. Uh, it's not just one uh, application, it's actually a, has a various uh, libraries, backends, protocol decoders, uh, some third party firmware for some logic analyzers, and a graphical front end which I'll show a demo later on. Uh, like I said, it aims to make a common framework uh, for uh, various logic analyzers and other debugging devices. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, it's, it's not just one package. Uh, there's a whole lot. It's like a lib sigrock. Um, it's pretty much the heart and brains of the uh, uh, application. It handles uh, interfacing to the devices, uh, uh, out, the output format, uh, and the control. Uh, there's lib sigrock. Decode, which is a Python 3 uh, interface uh, that uh, allows you to write Python uh, protocol decoders for uh, any of your trace, traces. Uh, and there's also the client application. Uh, it's command line backend. Uh, and there's also the utils that do uh, like FPH uh, uh, bitstream uh, rips out of uh, like logic analyzer software. So you can run uh, a SIGROC. Uh, and there's a collection of dumps uh, from various captures of devices, um, I squared C, uh, CAN, bus, uh, uh, SPY, etc. <coughs> and we also have a firmware for uh, some logic, uh, so basically Sally logic uh, clones and actually the actual device. Uh, it's basically a microcontroller that can do logic uh, analyzing. So we have that. Um, and PulseView, which is a QT front end for <laughs> LibSigRock. Uh, it's, it makes everything nice. Uh, uh, it's pretty recent uh, development. Uh, and here's pretty much how everything, well, uh, cut off a little bit there, but uh, the hardware interface, uh, and we have LibSigRock that interfaces to the devices uh, and puts output back to uh, uh, whether it's the client, uh, Client command line, uh, the GUI, uh, the, or the plugins. We have plugins for Python uh, and also Swig, which you can write for any of your own scripting languages. Uh, and there's, uh, I should say, those bindings. Uh, the plugins actually for Collect D, which is uh, I'll get into later. And also the LibSigRock Deco, which you can pass anything you're tracing into to, um, to decode uh, the protocols. Uh, this is not a complete list by any means, it's just some of the devices I've worked with. Um, logic analyzers, uh, the Open Logic Sniffer is one I've used a lot. Um, the Salia Logic 16 is another one. And as for oscilloscopes, uh, the, the, the Rigol uh, DS1052E, it's a cheap one, about 50 megahertz. Uh, it's a decent one. Uh, and some of the other supported devices, we have mixed mode devices, digital multimeters. Uh, analog devices, uh, like thermometers, hydrometers, light meters. Uh, the full list is available on the SIGROC wiki. Uh, here's a screenshot of the, it's kind of blurry, but there's a screenshot of the wiki, the wiki page. There are all devices we support, uh, like uh, sound level meters, oscilloscopes, multimeters. There's a whole list. Uh, feel free to add to this if you get a chance. Uh, now, the one advantage of the SIGROC is we have uh, an output format that's uh, device agnostic. Uh, it's interchangeable between devices. Uh, so basically, that uh, usually when you have a proprietary uh, an application that comes with your logic analyzer, 
you're pretty much stuck using that. So whatever you trace with, it's going to be the same no matter what. Uh, it's, it's a simple hex dump, actually, of the actual uh, uh, channel dumps, of, like the buffers off a logic analyzer, and uh, it's compressed using zip algorithms. So you can see data rates, uh, you can see compression rates of 100 times of repeating samples. Uh, and traces uh, can actually be broken into uh, chunks, which is useful when you're using the GUI and uh, if you want to do like, protocol decoding in real time, you need to have a set data to run the protocol decoder on. And if you wanted to keep tracing uh, continuously, uh, that's one way you could do it. Or you could have multiple devices uh, operating to the same format file. Uh, the common metadata is uh, it's useful for uh, uh, clients uh, and protocol decoding it keeps basic data. I'll show you right here, like uh, the sample rate, what probes are used, uh, the actual labels for each of the probes, uh, how many groups are enabled. Uh, see, there's a capture file of logic one, uh, which device was used, uh, and also what version. And here's an example of a, one of the output files unzipped. And you can see a hex dump of logic one. So three there would be uh, probe one and zero are high, so that's transmit or, uh, and receives high. And you see it's two, which means uh, receive went low. So this is a this is a UART dump of a GPS module. Uh, other supported formats. For, uh, where we have value change dump, which is kind of a Verilog thing. Uh, analog for digital multimeters and oscilloscopes. Uh, com comma separated values, which is uh, it's not very useful. I don't think but it's it's quite large, but it's very uh, ex ex exportable. Uh, GNU plot that's pretty self-explanatory. You can output your waveforms in a nice graphical format. Uh, and also we have some various vendor specific ones like the Open Logic <coughs> Sniffer uh, output and the Chrono View uh, Logic uh, Analyzer 8 uh, output. The LES one was actually helpful with debugging Pulse View kind of when it wasn't when it was crashing. I just want to see a graphical representation, and sometimes it was easier to do it that way. Sorry, but you're constantly feeding back into the okay. Uh, now, some of the units uh, that I, some of the, like Logic's, uh, the Log Open Logic Sniffer is uh, one of the units I use. It's very inexpensive. It's completely open source hardware. Uh, it, it can do 100 megahertz sampling, but not really, because the probes are kind of noisy. Uh, it can also do 200 megahertz sampling, but only uh, using a double data rate hack, where it's sampling on high and low of a clock but only on uh, the uh, FPGA's logic level, which is like 1.2 volts. Uh, nice advantage, it has hardware triggers, uh, run length encoding, uh, external clock. Uh, disadvantage of this one is uh, it's a dead project. It really hasn't been updated in two to three years. Uh, it only has a 24K sample buffer, and high-speed traces are pretty much useless uh, without run length encoding. Here's a picture of it. Uh, you can see it's pretty Spartan, and actually, it's a Spartan on there, PGA. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another one that uh, another one I don't actually have the Logic one, uh, but it's $150. Although the clones are pretty much the same thing, only you can find them much cheaper than that. Yeah, and, uh, the Cypress FX2 <laughs> microcontroller in there, so we have that SIGROC firmware, which you can load onto it. Uh, basically, it gets loaded on over USB the first time you do a trace, or the first time it gets initialized. Uh, the one I do have right here, actually, is a Salient Logic uh, 16. It's a little it's twice as expensive. Uh, the first one can only do 24 megahertz on uh, 16 channel, no, eight channels. Um, this one can do three on three at 100 megahertz, kinda. It's but it's USB 2, so there's really there's no hardware buffer on the device, so it's piping over USB as fast as it can. 
So uh, I'm kind of skeptical it's actually doing that. Uh, it's only software only triggers. So basically, it's, you have to filter it on the software side. Uh, see, this is a little more professional than the last one, so. Uh, yes, protocol decoders. Uh, that's the main advantage of uh, SigRock is uh, a lot of uh, applications that you get with logic analyzers, you can do protocol decoding, but it's pretty rare. Uh, we have a feature, of, you can do stackable ones, so you can uh, take an I2C uh, dump and pipe it into another one below it of a certain device. Uh, some examples would be like I2C into a weed nunchuck. Instead of seeing just a bunch of commands, you could actually see uh, the, the uh, actual um, like up, down, uh, uh, pressed on the output. Uh, we support all the common uh, protocols like I2C, SPI, CAN, OneWire, UART. Uh, and they can be done with the client or the GUI. Uh, some of, depending on what you're uh, debugging, <laughs> one or the other could be more useful. For uh, like UART stuff, if you do want to see a string uh, of the coming out of the UART dump, you would want to use a client. Or for instance, if you want to see uh, something that's I support C commands that's uh, pi piped into another protocol decoder. But there's some times where it's useful to see it in the GUI, which is like if you want to see the GPS data along with the pulse per second, you want to see, see the when it goes high and low. Uh, I squared C, GPI expander, if you want to see the I squared C commands and you want to confirm that the, the outputs are high or low. Uh, they're all, since, like I said, the protocol decoders are written in Python, so uh, it's pretty easy to, uh, to uh, basically use one of the boilerplates we already have. Uh, uh, and the annotations uh, come in both uh, the output and input. I kind of worded that wrong there, but that allows you to stack protocols. You would, you would basically for the I squared C protocol decoder, you uh, label the output as I squared C. Then, if you have another uh, another protocol decoder, you would have it. I only accept uh, input from I squared C or SPI, and you could uh, deduce what you want to do, how to process that data. Uh, they're most most of the decoders are pretty much state machines, and they should be because if you basically you say uh, I'm going to start. If I'm going to start a command, I should expect this command next, and then after that, obviously you need some error uh, checking. Uh, like I said, with the FX2 chipset devices, the open source firmware is available. Um, like I said, the one disadvantage is the microcontroller needs doesn't actually uh, keep any of the actual um, data that's loaded, uh, you have to load it every time. Same thing with the salient logic, the FVGA gets uh, the bit stream piped over the first time you do a trace. Or, uh, I mean, various low-end logic analyzers use this, and it's good, good enough for 90% of most people's uses. If you're debugging low-speed buses like I2C, SPI. Uh, I I mean, once you require over 24 megahertz sampling clock, you're probably going to have to go a little higher end anyways. So you can see this is pretty basic uh, design. Some uh, features that don't exist currently in SIGROC, but we'd like to do in the future. Uh, a lot of them have to do with triggering. Uh, serial triggers would be nice for, for instance, currently it's only, we only support parallel triggers, so basically you have probes so that go high or low, and it would trigger the trigger stage. Uh, with serial, you would basically select one probe and tie it with an external clock. So if you want to see a spy command, just kick, kick off a tr trigger, that you would use that. Uh, also, multi-stage would be uh, another one. We don't have that yet. Uh, now, software triggers, like I said, there's a lot of like, logic, and logic analyzers that don't actually do any hardware. Uh, but it, it does have an advantage. You can do more extensible uh, triggering without hacking the Verilog on 
a lot of the like the Ophthalmologic Sniffer or a lot of other ones. Uh, nice to have analog to di digital channel conversion right now. Uh, for instance, if you had like a four port oscilloscope and you wanted to change one port to digital logic, obviously you can get a mixed mode device, but if you just want to use one probe as a digital input. Uh, multiple devices per capture and uh, nice to have Pulse to have some analog support right now. It's only digital signals. Oh, yes. Uh, bindings. We have Python. That's pretty uh, explanatory. Uh, SWID. You can basically write for any scripting language you wanted to later on. Uh, now, the Collect D, uh, <coughs> it's basically graphing. Uh, basically, you can do a graphs from it. It's basically a circular database that, uh, that updates. Uh, and I'll show you a graph later for this. Uh, I mean, use cases would be like sound lever meter or carbon monoxide uh, monitoring and near a furnace. And there's pretty much, uh, uh, I don't remember the device offhand, what is it? Did you use to trace this or is that, ooh? Um, it was a sound. Okay. Sound What? Oh. Yeah. 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 Did, 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 okay. did, did you read the numbers? It was everything maximum 70 dB. <coughs> that, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is basically what one of the configs would look like uh, for the Collect D. Uh, you have a plug in, you pick the driver, uh, the connection is a USB over uh, serial, serial over USB, and updates once a second. Nothing really you see here. Uh, pulse view, yeah. Well, s s before we really didn't have any GUI for SIGROC, and it was kind of holding everything back uh, because we liked the command line for a lot of time. And uh, the previous attempts kind of were buggy, but Joel's been doing a lot of work on that. Uh, it allows, I mean, visual displaying of samples and actual protocol decoding. Uh, here's here's a screenshot in case my demo fails. So, so this is what it, this is what it looks like. Yeah, so there's my so it's the uh, you can see the CAN probe, and you can see the uh, decoding up there of the actual protocol. Uh, like well, the continuous samples. Uh, a lot of the like for this Logic 16, you can totally do continuous samples, but. Uh, if there, there's USB timeout issues I've noticed, so it, you really don't get that all the time. Uh, hopefully USB 3 will, will have a version of that. Uh, say Lee will come out of Logic 16 with the USB 3 interface. Uh, run length encoding uh, is a good solution, but uh, their holdups, you can be tracing forever effectively if you have the wrong settings and nothing changes. Uh, uh, trigger types are important because uh, for instance, uh, with, whether it's serial or parallel. Uh, an external clocking is uh, useful. Not all, that doesn't have an external clock input, but the open logic sniffer does, which, it, which is very handy for stuff that you want to, you don't want to have the internal clock of the, your device. You want to actually have the clock of the bus. Uh, now, chaining with external triggers in and out, uh, you can do that with the open logic sniffer which is, might not seem, I mean, it's already 32 uh, probes, but the problem is it can only debug at one logic level. So if you had two, you could have it uh, tied together. One would be de debugging a 3.3 volt logic signal, and another would be 1.8. Uh, now, one length encoding, there's a few things that uh, we kind of ran into. It's uh, interesting. like. For instance, if you're debugging two probes, uh, it's only going to enable, you might enable only one channel group, which seems okay. But the problem is the, the value is going to be 8 bits, but the count's going to be 8 bits. So if you have a signal that's not changing, you're running through that buffer really fast. Now, sometimes it makes sense to enable a second group, so you have 16 or 15 bits, depending, and you have a 16 or 15 bit count even though you're not using those other value bits. Uh, now, uh, simple microcontrollers can be used as logic analyzers, like with FX2. 
You can also use the Beagle Bones PRU, for instance. Uh, multiple devices chained or for different logic levels, like I said. Okay, now let's see, uh, get to the demo. Basically, I'm going to show you uh, an example of using the command line. That's when it's more useful than the, the UI. Uh, protocol decoding. Uh, and with Pulse View, I'll show you a display of samples and uh, tr uh, actually the tracing of the GPS module, which doesn't have a, doesn't have a fix because we're inside a building, but uh, that's what it looks like right here. I forgot to name the probes. Do you have to speak German to for these incantations? What? what? You, have, you have the first one of the probe names. Which one? Oh. Yeah. It was the correct other way? that the trace of the GPS module here. There's no fix, so it's going to be kind of useless, but get a baud rate. So basically this is going to this is going to set through the the UART protocol decoder. Then it's going to pass it off to the UART dump, which will show strings of the actual uh, UART data. And as you see, there's no GPS coordinates, so there's no fix. Yeah. Uh, there's one more thing in the client I'd like to show. Let's see. So there's, this is a, quite a few devices on a I square C bus. <clears throat> now the problem is you only want to debug one device, but you have think multiple things talking on the same bus. So we pass it. We're going to pass it through an I square the I square C protocol decoder, and we're going to send it through a filter one, and then we're going to send it through a real time clock decoder. So that's basically it. That's a little more re user readable than seeing. This is one a little more user readable than seeing a waveforms on a, a GUI actually. But no. <laughs> I will see the same thing in now here's a GPS dump of an actual trip actually when it got a fix
So they picked up the probes. He's gonna add 600. Probably need to zoom out a bit. Yep. Yeah. And it's pretty much the bites. And basically open this again. So I get the probe name's kind of lazy, so gonna, but I can do a trace now. And you can see it. But that pulse per second is not correct, so it didn't get a lock, so data is going to be useless. Okay, so things that uh, the community can help us with is setting us like protocol dumps of various protocols, nothing too ancient or weird for submission. Some things, we, some examples we like to see is like DMX, lighting, MIDI, uh, various G GPS uh, modules and I2C. Uh, it's the first step to uh, writing a protocol decoder. Uh, even if you don't want to write one, basically if you, just, you can help us out with just giving us traces. Uh, basically, uh, if you find bugs, because there are a lot of bugs, especially in the GUI right now, but no, no, no offense. <laughs> but uh, report that any you find, just don't, just don't get mad and not report it, because it does help. Uh, contribute to the wiki. Uh, I mean, post breakdowns of various logic analyzer oscilloscopes that you might have or protocols uh, that communicate to those devices. Uh, free hardware is always helpful, but yeah. And as always, uh, patches are welcome. Uh, so questions? Went through pretty fast, but. You missed all the cool buzzwords. Oh, <laughs> I didn't work ecosystems in there? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> How does the oscilloscope help support the wall for so a slight correct is what Matt said, PulseView does have basic support for analog. Um, but we haven't really used it on anything much beyond the ALSA input driver. So hmm. yeah, it's kind of basic, and I don't have any oscilloscopes. Do you have like triggers, things like that? Um, we, we do have um, um, some oscilloscope drivers already. <coughs> the right all, and, so. uh, and another one, I forget which. Uh, um, and, and quite a few more coming, and they generally support um, everything the device supports, so same to the triggering, all the same drivers. Is there any open hardware oscilloscope example thing available? There is, there is one, the um, Aussie Prime. Um, yeah, Aussie Prime, by Nexus Computing in Switzerland. Um, it's also FX2 based. Um, really goes up to well, the same limits as any FX2 device. It's limited by USB bus. So it's probably just 10 megahertz or something. The, the default that they, well, what they advertise it with is uh, 6 megahertz, but it will go higher. Is it the one that's basically using an uh, Android smartphone? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yeah. If, if you have a scope that has some decent bandwidth and you like to support it, it probably would take something like even more than a few hours to write a driver because it's only Three or four hundred miles to code to do it, right? So is it the problem with percentage bugs? Well, no, I can't do that. So I, don't know. <laughs> I have a little oscilloscope. It's like a pick with a screen, mm. and I tried to integrate that in eight months ago, and it just seemed like the oscilloscope support wasn't quite there yet. It's there. It's there. It's there. Yeah. Mm. You, you can use it quite quite handily with the Rigel. <coughs> Any more questions? I'm not a network guy, so I have to use Wireshark often. Has there been thought of putting this into Wireshark and using Wireshark to decode the code for high level protocols? I don't think so, has there? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's, but it's, basically, it's, um, it's kind of almost doable. Uh, the problem with Wireshark is that they have um, the C, C language decoders and the Lua decoders. Yeah. Um, and, um, well, you'd have to interface with both of those. Mm. 
that for wire shark support. But we've always envisioned that when we have enough uh, protocol decoders in, in uh, the Cinderella decode, at some point it's going to become pointless to add another level on top because Wireshark has all that stuff. Yeah. So that's which is probably what you mean. So yeah, at some point we'll have to look at it because it's all doable. Right? And the other thing is that um, uh, Sigrox is kind of like a pipe and, and it, that plays really well with units. And so in a way, if you can get data out of it in any format that's convenient to you, then it's up to your imagination to do what you think could help you downstream. So at least there could be a peak in our output. Yeah, yeah, anything might be helpful. Maybe any glue that we still can't make something easy. I have one. And a, a pick up output uh, 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 is actually quite easy to do. You can do that quite fast. Any more questions? I, I saw you had USB up there for protocol. What kind of hardware do you hook up to for doing USB analysis? Uh, which one do we have supported? Well, this, um, uh, what this was done with was um, your fairly low end uh, logic analyzers, which means uh, USB 1.1 yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, very low speeds. Um, but the, um, I, I guess you're talking about the, um, the USB analyzers and such, the deagles and such. I don't know. Or, yeah, no, because uh, those don't really give you. Well, they do some, some get you on the low level packets, but basically we haven't really tried with, uh, you know, to feed, feed one into the other. It should be doable. Uh, I have no excuse, I actually have a beagle. <laughs> I've not, not even used it yet. But, yeah. If you don't use it, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but is it actually a, a problem of uh, people with high bandwidth here providing too little bumps or, or what? What, what's the, the, the reason for for being limited to, let's say, USB uh, 1.1? Oh, it's, it's, it's just a uh, simple bandwidth. Um, simple, um, as soon as you hit uh, USB 2.0, you're talking about uh, 480 megabit raw. Um, that's, that means you need more than that in uh, a sample rate. And you need basically some sort of storage because you can't obviously shift that live over the over another USB bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's it's just really <coughs> well, like Joe, that's one thing about <coughs> it samples the USB at USB clock, compresses it some sort, and then ships that to the computer over a specialized USB port. <coughs> Why well, have the Beagle though? Sorry, have the one point one Beagle stuff. Okay, that does not all to say, but. The 480 use um, has an additional USB port for that. So, no, I live in the no, no. in the hardware itself. I know as a uh, a signal. I never use it in signal because Polysoft uh, provides little software for Beagle. Mm. And the FX2 hourly is in the FPGA, right? What? All the RLE mentioned here takes place in the FPGA on the logic analyzer, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. The FX2 doesn't actually, um, it just has a tiny little 8051 core, very slow. Uh, I think it runs at 12 megahertz or 24 megahertz or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, basically, the USB shipping functionality, it doesn't hit the 8051 at all. It has no way to uh, alter or compress. Any more questions? All right, thanks, thanks for coming.